Um, Carol got a hold of me and just six months ago and asked me to give my testimony. Yes, just kind of jumped right out. And I'm thinking to myself, where did that come from? Well, usually I'd say, wait, wait, I'll pray about it. And, uh, and that would be the easy way to maybe say no, you know. And, and, uh, you know, I travel with Janet quite a bit and have an opportunity to um, be in front of people, but it's usually just to introduce her and then hide behind back, show the slides, and doing the technical part where I can just be invisible, you know, and it, it's great to do that. So I went out to my car and I just began to pray, like, God, ah, are you sure that this should be a mess? And, and he said, yeah, I've been preparing you to do this. And I opened the door and I was going to make sure that you didn't shut it. So... Just to verify, I called Janet. I'm like, Janet, can you believe I just said yes to this? What am I supposed to do? And, and she said the exact same thing to me. So I knew that God had prepared me, and it was my time to start sharing about my journey. I was married in 92, very fortunate. My daughter was born in March of 94, and my son in December of 95. They loved each other from the start, close in age, grew up together, they're friends, were friends of friends, and um, it was a close-knit bond, it was great. Uh, when my son was about two, um, he had fallen and had to have a CAT scan, and at that point we had discovered that he was missing his processing link, which is, he had to learn in a different way. Most of the things were repetitive for him to be able to actually learn. So we knew that going through, he might have a little bit of trouble. Uh, and then about four years later, he was diagnosed with Tourette's. For us, it was just great. You know, we saw the tips, we didn't think anything of it. But for others, it opened up a wide opportunity to bully. So we began to seek medical treatment to try to minimize the Tourette's, you know, the tips and everything that would come out. And really, the doctors did a great job of that. But unfortunately, kids didn't forget. So later on, as he got into high school, they seemed to get worse through puberty. So, we, we sought out on the counselor, the counselor that actually had friends himself. And it was the greatest gift that God could give us. Because Greg could ask the questions about his future, about what, how he could overcome this, how he could go into um, college and, and what his kids have and, and everything, he just became so reassured about himself that he would be okay. And so as we went through high school and testing and stuff, Greg actually was an honor roll student all the way through junior high and high school, which is an absolute um, blessing because for what he had to overcome in learning and his disability, nobody expected that. They always expected like, him to be struggling all the way through life. So we were very blessed in that aspect. Greg was an outstanding athlete. He was a state champion in hockey as a goaltender. He loved soccer, was on varsity at an early age. Um, he was going to have, have a career in welding. He loved to hunt. Didn't matter if it was bow, didn't matter if it was a gun. In the off season, he would kill squirrel because I'd find him in my freezer because he thought I was actually going to cook them for him. <laughs> so he just loved to be in the woods. And one of his absolute favorite things to do was make maple syrup with my husband. He had done that from just when he could barely stand all the way up until the last season. And he went from tapping the trees to hauling it over to boiling it and in the middle of the night drawing it off. And it's pretty good stuff, isn't it, Carol? <laughs> so he, he, he just he just grasped on to always being around my husband and learning things from him. So, and then in June of, well, June or July of 2012, um, we did meet in Orlando, and these two books are the books that came out. And Holy Estrogen, I call it God's perfect timing in my life, because God knew what my future held, and He placed Carol in my life. And it is an awesome book, so if you don't have it, you can get it. But Carol, the first thing I thought about her, and I went back and talked about Janet, she just loves the Lord. She is a prayer warrior, and she wants heaven bigger and hell smaller. And, and she just radiated with that. And you don't always see that, even amongst your own church and everything. And, and you know, we instantly connected. And, and it was um, right before my daughter was entering into Hilbert, which is right out here, so we communicated and had a lot of interest in that. And something interesting about that summer is when Words Matter came out, which is something Janet wrote, 
and we worked on, we had interviewed Greg for the one section of this book, and it was When the Bully Comes to Town. And um, that's in the book right here. And we wanted to know the ins and outs of what the effects a bully has. And is it 24-7? Does it just happen in school? Is it just social media? Is it face-to-face? -face? Um, are the bullies being punished? You know, we really wanted to understand from a teenager standpoint. And then we wrote that. So now I'm going to fast forward you to um, June 17th of 2013. Uh, finals were being taken, but at this point my son had already completed his regences because they're, they're not in school, they just go take the test and come home. He had got up that morning like any other morning and he had asked to go to my father-in-law's, which was all the time. And um, he would go up and he'd help him do his chores and then he'd go over on the hill and we didn't know what he was going to catch that day. And then um, he would go back over and help my father-in-law and it'd kind of be a routine that he always did. Well, that particular day, about 5 o'clock, we had been trying to get a hold of him. Texted him, wasn't responding. We were trying to call my father-in-law's house, and he wasn't answering, but we figured he was out guarding or whatever. So about 7 o'clock came, and we're like, something's just not right. So we decided to get in the vehicle and head up to my father-in-law's. And I had texted Janet, and I'm like, Janet, something's not right. Could you please just pray? So as we headed up there, um, we hopped on the four wheelers and went and checked out the hill because we knew we had known that he went over there. And we had eventually, after about an hour and a half, found his four wheeler with the keys still in it, which was which was very odd. So we didn't know if he went hiking up in or if he fell, or what had happened. So we raced back across to get some flashlights because it was dark at that point. And as we headed back over there with the flashlights, it was just my husband and I at that point. We found our son, and he had passed away. And at that moment, all I did was scream, no! And it was so loud that they said that they heard it back across the street. And I just laid there holding my son and thinking, how am I going to go on without my boy? And as we waited for the help to come, and to direct them to where they needed to be. We just talked to Greg, and I know that sounds strange, but we're just like, Greg, why didn't you call us? Why didn't you come to us like you did every other time in life? Why didn't you trust God like we had talked about? Why didn't you, why didn't you, why didn't you? And as we got the help, Gino and I headed back over to my father-in-law's, and we were trying to figure out how we were going to call my daughter. How were we going to tell my daughter, the one that was best friends with my son, that her brother had passed away? So we got in the house, and he decided that I should be the one that made the call. Um, and so I got on the phone, I made sure somebody was with her, and I told her. And it was probably one of the hardest things I've had to do in my life, and I hope I never have to repeat anything like that. But she says, Mom, we're going to get through it together, and we're not going to give up. That was my daughter's response at 19 years old. And so we got her right home, and I called Janet. And Janet began walking through, sending prayer chain out to people around the world that we had met through speaking. Text Carol, I'm praying for you. Anything I can do, let me know. Beth hopped in her car from Ohio, drove three and a half hours in the middle of the night to get to us so she could be there the next morning. None of these women asked what happened. They didn't want to know details. The details didn't matter. They just knew we needed prayer. They knew that our tears would have not allowed us to be able to read the word. Our minds would be so exhausted that we probably couldn't pray or think straight, pray or think straight. So they did it for us. So as we had at home that night, we began to get social media about what they all believed happened that night. And so we immediately said, we're shutting it off. We'll have other people watch it, but we can't read this stuff. They don't know the truth.
And then we decided, we'll take some of the texts and messages from friends we can trust, Christians that are in our life, because we need encouragement. And then we got some messages like this. God won't give you any more than you can handle. Delete. <laughs> Why did you let your son have a gun? Delete. I went to a psychic and everything's going to be okay. I don't see anything about a psychic in the word. Delete. And this one is the most heartbreaking one of all. What sin have you committed that God has punished you for? These were Christians that were sending this to us. So we did not receive any more texts without somebody else seeing them first. But we wanted to have contact with people that were out of the area, our family that lived all the way over in California. So we decided the funeral home condolence page had to be safe. And then this showed up. What do you do? Your heart's torn out of you. You've lost your son. You're getting messages from Christians. And then you look at the condolence page and you get a message like this. You can't see it. Well, I'll tell you what it says. Ha, 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 he's dead. I hope he's in hell. <laughs> Not only did they bully him before he passed away, they took a shot at him after he was deceased. <coughs> so we knew that we had three things we needed to do before we buried our son. John 8.32 tells us that the truth will set us free. So at this service, we made it known that it was in fact suicide and chose to take that opportunity to witness to the 300 plus people, mostly his friends, um, to encourage them that it was a bad choice, but to try to show our faith in the matter and to show them that, um, to trust God with it and not take it in your own hands. In Colossians 3.13, it says we need to forgive um, out of obedience. So the second thing we needed to do is we needed to forgive the individuals who wrote that message. Because we needed to get past that. We needed to be able to move forward. And the third was the hardest of all. We needed to forgive our son. We needed to forgive him for not trusting us. We needed to forgive him for giving up after all that he had overcome. We needed to forgive him for choosing a permanent solution to a temporary problem. So... After his funeral, we went away for a little bit to figure out how are we going to grieve and get through this? How are we going to do it as a family? And we knew we needed to set boundaries. We knew we, knew we, we couldn't blame each other for what happened. We knew that we needed to commit to this relationship even more than we were already committed. And we knew that we needed to set guidelines for Julianne. And what we set up for her is that she could not change anything for one year. We would give her the support she needed, but she needed to stay in school and not make any major changes. During my grieving, I, I made a lot of mistakes. And some of them you'll read, because I work with a writer, you'll just see the name change difference. And they are pretty funny, some of them, but there's one I want to share with you today, because I hope that none of you would make that mistake. I asked God why he didn't give Greg a second chance. Because when he was on that hill that day, God was the only one that could have stopped it. It was the evil of the world that took Greg to that point. But God could have stopped it. So I wanted to know why he didn't. I didn't get an answer for a while. So I asked again, except for I thought I'd help God out. And so I had a list with me and said, God, this one, he's overdosed twice and we brought him back with a narcon shot. And, and this one, he was in a car accident. You remember that, God, that car accident where I don't know how anybody lived out of that. And, and this one here, he did this and you let him live again? Why didn't you let God live and Greg live again? That was a mistake. God answered me. And when he answered me, he said this, Carrie, I knew Greg was coming home and they weren't. And now it's your job to witness to them. 
oh, that hurt. Because what I was really asking, God, why didn't you send them to hell so I could have one more day with my son? I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want that. I want everybody in heaven. At that point, it was a huge change in my healing. I got down on my knees and I physically had to release Greg to God. I had to give him back to him. And that's when God could start using me for his glory. The soccer team had come to us and asked us to support them. They couldn't seem to get past this. And so we chose to go to all the games. And when we showed up the first game, we saw this. And it was very hard. But in the end, we looked at it and we said, yeah, they keep looking for their 12th man, but they're always looking to God. They're always looking up. It's a way of witnessing. And then, for graduation, they asked us to go. And at that time, another one of his classmates, and there was only 75 in the class, had committed suicide six months before. And so there's two chairs at graduation empty, and their graduation caps. And we sat through it. And then when we got back from graduation, we had received this picture from his classmates, and then they showed up at their house with some letters personally written to us, thanking us for walking them through the journey. Six months later, our daughter graduated from college. They didn't walk till May, but she went up and took this picture of her with Greg and gave it to us this last Christmas saying, Mom, I promised Greg the day he died that I would never give up on my dreams and that he would be there for me and I was going to make him proud. And not only did I make him proud by graduating, I did it with honors. And then today, I just briefly show you where we are today. This is my daughter and her boyfriend, Ian, and my husband and I. And we have created a scholarship fund that we are giving to students to encourage them and empower them to go to college. And we have given over $5,000 away in two years, and we're continuing to get that. And we're continuing to help kids as they feel bullied, and parents who are dealing with suicidal kids or themselves. And God has truly healed us and is using us because we've never taken our eyes off him. Because we have Carol's and Janice and Beth's in our lives who have continued to pray over us so that we never take our eyes off God. And so I just thank you so much for letting me share today.